how various funds have been affected, if any, by the COVID-19 pandemic. And obviously to uh, get some insight into the various different uh, funds from an asset manager perspective, and to obviously get some insights of how these funds are positioned uh, now that, uh, that we've got this epidemic. So a little bit of housekeeping first is that at the bottom of your screen, you have a chat button. So should you want to uh, ask any questions, please write a, a little note to whoever you want to answer the question or you can send it to me and I will direct it to the various participants. Uh, the, uh, the agenda is that I am going to ask each of the fund managers to introduce themselves and then I am going to then let them do a little bit of a presentation as to uh, how the fund is affecting them, if any, and uh, we'll then ask some questions uh, around that. So um, at the, there will, will be some polls going out during the course of the event. So just to get some sort of idea as to who is, you know, some, some, some information, that would be great. And uh, if you've got any questions, there is an opportunity to, uh, to, to raise your hand as well. So uh, today we have a whole lot of different uh, fund managers, all from various different, uh, have, they've got all different uh, strategies. So I welcome at uh, Darren Falls, who would be representing uh, both Medluli Safari Lodge and Meta Capital. I have Adrian Rasmus, who will be representing Rensel. We've got Avi Cap Gordon, who will be uh, representing Sunstone Capital and Decentral Energy. And we have Amaresh Chetty, who will be talking about uh, the Pepper Club. So welcome, guys. Uh, it's a diverse diversified panel, we cover a whole lot of different uh, asset classes. One would be energy, which would be in uh, commercial and industrial, that would be decentral energy. Uh, we have energy in commercial and residential type space, and that would be Audrey Erasmus. Uh, hospitality, we have two funds, which is the Medluli Safari Lodge uh, in the Kruger National Park and the Pepper Club in the city of Cape Town. We have uh, rent, asset rentals, which is going to be uh, Avi Gordon, who will talk to that. And we have a fund of funds, which is Meta Capital, which Darren would, will speak to all. So it's quite interesting to actually see the effect of what COVID has actually done to business generally, not only in South Africa, not only in Africa, but uh, throughout the world. And uh, really what it means is that there has to be a reset and how are we as section 12 j fund managers going to reset uh, in terms of current economic climate and then going forward the one good news is that 12 j has got a five-year time span so it's a medium to long-term view so what it means is that it's not immediately that one has to uh, buy or sell uh, your investment, one has a five-year term, whereby the asset can obviously, and how it's gonna perform over the five years. So, um, you know, we're going to have to adopt. All businesses are going to have to adopt to a new normal. I think new businesses are gonna spring up as a result of that. All businesses are gonna to have to reinvent themselves uh, as a result of the, the COVID uh, pandemic. And uh, it's going to be quite interesting to see what happens. Very clearly, the stock markets, both South Africa and internationally, have taken a huge hammering. And how does that compare to the 12J as a class? Something else that we'll be able to discuss in more detail. I think the interest rate uh, has got a, a major effect on how it affects 12 J's. One, we've had a 200 basis point reduction. So what it means is that under 
employed capital is now only earning 4% on call. And also that if there's any gearing introduced into a fund, therefore you, the, the gearing costs are much lower at, at prime being 7.75%. So these all have effects and, uh, and, and, how, and for better and for worse. And we're going to also ask how uh, the fund managers are dealing with these issues. So I think I'm going to ask each of the fund managers in no particular order, but I think let's start, I think with the energy funds. So let's start with you, Avi, if you can give us a little bit of uh, understanding of the central energy capital, how you're playing, what it plays in, and any, you know, and how, if there's been any effects as a result of COVID. Over to you, Avi. Okay, thank you. Morning, Jeff. Morning, everyone. Um, thanks for having me here. So maybe just to give you a brief overview of what we do at Decentral Energy Capital. So we're energy specialists. So what we do is we invest in predominantly in solar energy assets in the commercial and industrial space. And the way we go about doing this is we have two separate offerings that we offer to landlords or, or property owners. And I think it's important to just touch on, I guess, the strategy and how the business works before we can unpack the effect and how things play out. So the first type of arrangement that we we'll enter into is, you know, more your traditional, it's called the PPA, a power purchase agreement. What we'll do is we'll go on to, let's say, Graniti, which is one of our granite factories. What we'll do is we'll offer them cheaper energy. So we'll put up a solar asset with our own capital, with investors' capital, and th that asset will generate energy. And we'll enter into an agreement with them for 20 years where they purchase that energy from us at, at a steep discount. So, you know, last month they were paying 100 grand in, in energy to the municipality. This month, maybe they'll pay 70 grand to us. And I'm just keeping it very simple. Um, that's the first offering. The second type of offering is a little bit more complex. And generally, we enter into it with the larger property groups. So, you know, an example would be Spear, which is a REIT, uh, which we've just entered into agreement with on a number of their sites. What we do there is, you know, there's a typical way that a landlord can't over-recover energy. So they'll own this asset, they'll own this roof, I own this property, call it a small mall. Because if they get cheap energy from us, they just pass that discount onto their clients. And they're the ones who own the asset. They're the ones who are entering into the risk. Um, so what we've come up with the solution is that what they do is we put the asset up and we charge them the same rate as they get from municipality. But what we do is we rent their roof space from them, effectively creating extra income yield to them. It's an off-balance sheet solution, and they get a press on their property portfolio. Um, and this generally, we focus on larger groups and larger rollouts. Um, and it's a very attractive offering, and it's, it's led us quite far in the market. Uh, what we do as a fund, again, we, we're made up of a board of specialists. We've got energy specialists, the two guys I work with quite closely. Both have their master's degree in renewable engineering and 10 years experience in the space. And what we do is we partner with EPCs, with, with builders, let's call them, specialist builders on contracts. And we don't take any risk as a fund on the actual operational, you know, the building process. So we'll develop a site or identify an opportunity and we'll get a fixed price contract, you know, really reducing our risk, putting it all on them, making sure they're credible. So we really play the energy specialist, the development role, but with as much reduced risk as possible. So I guess that's what we do high level as a fund. Uh, maybe just to touch on some of the COVID effects, uh, a main one being the RAND dollar. I think, you know, generally your solar panels are brought in from overseas. So the change in price, obviously, in terms of the viability of commercial projects going forward, it will put a bit of a strain on that. Um, the other side of it is there's a, there's a crash crunch, right? So do our investees, do our partners, our counterparties, whoever we've put these solar panels up for, do they have the cash to pay us on a monthly basis? And um, that's, that's another question that needs to be addressed. And the others, the, I guess the positive in this, or from our point of view, is there's less capital available for, for growth and development within these property portfolios. So that means there's more of a demand for our kind of offering where, where we don't put a pressure on their balance sheet. They're able to save money on a monthly basis or earn additional income. And, and I think that's been quite an interesting space. Um, so, so kind of where we've been put in is... You know, there's a lot more opportunity, there's a lot more demand for our offering, but we just have to be a lot more selective over how we go about it and who we partner with. And as a result, the due diligence process has become a lot more complex. And um, so we were also fortunate enough to, 
I guess, secure some panels before the rate, the rate hike. So we've got some projects lined up and what we're going to be able to do is take advantage of this to create a little bit of more of a competitive advantage. But the, the general, there are pressures being put on the energy space through COVID-19. Yes, there's opportunity, but there's also a need for caution, a need to not rush into deals, not to spend your capital, not to try and rush the capital out the door, but to make sure you're investing in good, credible projects. Um, maybe to touch on some of the direct effects on our portfolio, what's been quite interesting is, you know, most of our, our parties we work with, they have anchor tenants, you know, it's a shopping mall, so there's a shop right or a pick and pay, and those are actually heavy energy users. So we've seen on our sites generally a drop of less than 5% in terms of energy usage on a month to month basis. So there is still very much a demand for the energy that we're producing. And I think we're quite fortunate just because of the space we play in. In some of the industrial properties, obviously that has dropped. Um, we have a unique aspect to the way we structure our deals, which is something called take and pay, take or pay. And what that means is as an energy user, as someone who we've entered into an agreement with, you have an obligation to purchase energy from us, even if you don't use all of it. Um, so I guess that's some security in terms of the cash flows of the project. The nice thing is, again, we enter into 20 year agreements with our counterparties. So we, and as Jeff mentioned, you know, this isn't, this isn't a geared project. These aren't geared portfolios. So we don't have massive debt payments to cover. So we do have a little bit of flexibility in terms of, you know, to date we have a need to, but should we need to structure some kind of payment plan to assist the landlords and our tenants and our, and our property owners, we, we are able to do such a thing. Um, maybe something else to touch on, and I'm just, I'm running through a lot of information, is that we ran an exercise and we realized that even if energy usage were to drop 30% or 40% in the malls, because there's, there's such a steep discount on the energy we provide, um, you know, our landlords, our tenants are still better off. And what that does is it creates more of a need for them to want to buy energy from us. Again, they are still spending money on utilities, so for them to keep purchasing from us and, and keep up to date is important because there is a saving created. Um, I guess that's a high level overview of everything, but quite important points, I guess, salient features to touch on is there is now less cash available. So how it's going to play out today, everyone is up to date on their payments from buying energy from us, but we've got to see as the market develops. We've got to approach with caution, new projects to make sure, you know, it's a credible counter party, that it's someone who we can see being around for the next 20 years. It's important, but at the same time, there is a lot of opportunity being created because our value add, our value creation by reducing OPEX costs or increasing rentals is, is really substantial and it's important in such a market. Um, I think that's hopefully a high level overview and I'm sure there'll be questions later. Thank you for having me here. If there's anything else? Thank you, Avi. Uh, so, so that's a lot of information and uh, we'll, di we'll dive down into a couple of those, you know, items that you've highlighted later. So uh, Audrey and you uh, represent Rensel and Rensel focuses on residential uh, energy uh, as opposed to Avi who deals in commercial and industrial. Do you want to give us a take on what's happening in the residential energy space? Thank you, Jeff. Um, yes. Yeah, so. Rensel is a Section 12J registered fund that focuses exclusively on the residential market. Now, there's a number of reasons for doing that. Um, the greatest, however, is the fact that the residential market makes up 35% of all the energy consumed in South Africa with virtually no offering. So there's no uh, asset rental agreements or PPAs that are being offered to them en masse, which has really hampered the sector's ability to adopt this technology as the owners have had to actually create their own assets by uh, under, undertaking that capital expenditure themselves. Now, this sector has some very unique characteristics, one of which is the very high electrical tariffs that have been charged to these consumers. So we've taken already a very expensive electrical tariff that was being charged by ESCOM, and in the municipalities, we'll put a 100% marker on that electrical tariff. Now, what this means is that you've taken a high electricity price and you've made it one of the highest in the world which has given us a lot of uh, room to create very creative solutions for these consumers. So we can incorporate batteries at a cost neutral point. So where the client isn't paying any more on their existing power bill or, in, or they can actually get to the point where they still save electricity while being immune to load shedding uh, or incidental power failures. Now, this fund targets a 21% IRR and we're currently developing two large projects. Uh, the one is a 220 unit 
uh, complex and the other is a 145 unit um, retirement village. Now combined, these two projects have a one megawatt hour battery storage capacity. So that's over 1000 kilowatt hours uh, of storage. Now we're using lithium batteries to achieve this. And this order is one of the largest in, uh, in the energy sector in South African history. So we're currently working with other Section 12J funds and institutional investors to secure the capital to uh, develop these projects. And we're expecting to be on site uh, early next week. Now, we are looking to raise further capital through Rensel to develop more of these projects going forward, giving the opportunity to the investors to invest directly uh, into these projects through Rensel, so not through another means uh, where they would part, have only part uh, exposure, um, as, as an example, some of the other funds that we're working with. Now, during the corona uh, epidemic that we find ourselves in, we've seen that all of our consumers have had significantly high demand because everyone is working from home, they're cooking from home. Um, what this means is that none of our plants have actually gone down. Uh, we've had higher demand than normal and we've actually been generating more income as a consequence. We've also found a significantly increased consumer interest in the product as people have suddenly realized how vulnerable they are at home, uh, at the office or at your retail outlet perhaps. You have uh, a generator backup so you can still continue your work, uh, you can still send your emails, um, you can still have some internet connectivity. Now, when you're at home and you don't have this or you're in a complex and you don't have this, this it is a real vulnerability to consumers. Now, we haven't, haven't had a great impact other than our projects had to be delayed. We were meant to have started the week of the lockdown, actually the, the, the day that it started, um, but this is now unfortunately had to be pushed out. We are able to operate under the level four lockdown uh, because we are um, supply of electricity, gas and water, we fall under that category because it's a new build. Uh, and because of the energy crisis in the country, uh, they've actually prioritized us and, uh, and all renewable energy development projects under, under that category. And we, we look forward to being able to start work uh, in, the, in the very near future. Participants uh, once we have our question and answer session. I think now, okay, so we've, we've now covered both uh, energy sectors, both commercial and industrial, as well as residential. Let's go into the hospitality uh, arena. We've got two funds uh, in hospitality, one being Medluli Safari Lodge and the other one being uh, the Pepper Club. Let's kick off with you, Darren, being uh, Medluli Safari Lodge. Do you want to tell us uh, a little bit about your fund and how that has been affected, if any? Sure. Um, so, good, firstly, good morning to you, Jeff, and good morning to, to everyone who's participating today. Um, really, Safari Lodge really represents <clears throat> a dynamic and, uh, and interruptive, um, disruptive um, timeshare type model within the Section 12J space. The first Section 12J to be launched within the, the popular Kruger now. National Park, and it's a 50-50 partnership with the Mbili community. And the story really dates back um, to the 60s, where this community was forcibly removed from their land and uh, subject to a dawn of democracy and a successful land claim in 94. The Mbili community have the unique um, right to 850 hectares of freehold title land within the Kruger National Park, actually within the borders. And uh, they partner with the private sector through through Section 12J to develop an asset there to extract value from this extreme unique opportunity. Um, and where we sit today as a, as a project um, is that we've completed phase one of the development. Um, the lodge itself was opened on the 17th of January and uh, prior to the COVID pandemic had its close to eight weeks of operations um, of which really the product itself was taken to market um, with such a successful launch and uh, really, really strong forward occupancies being achieved just from the nature and the spec of the product. Um, I do notice a few of our investors on the call and a lot of them have paid their own site visits or done their own investor bookings. And uh, I think they can speak to the value proposition behind the product itself. It's unique price point, it's fantastic spec 
Um, and where obviously this impact comes into COVID-19 is obviously quite dramatic within the hospitality space. Um, where Embluti has been a, really a step above has been its agileness to direct its campaigns to domestic travel now and um, to leverage its relationships with the HA, which is the tour operator who have some of the largest tour operator networks both locally and abroad, and also to mobilize their own marketing team to kind of direct um, the, the domestic travel where that'll be the first kind of phase of opening from this pandemic. And uh, that's really kind of been a testament to the management team. Um, it's showcased, um, yes, that this sector has been obviously the worst hit within this uh, specific dynamic, but it's showcased that um, with the right people involved that this can be kind of turned around. And I think another showcase of that has been this um, COVID-19 relief initiative that has been launched by, by the team um, through the Swan Group and SPA have been instrumental again at, at showcasing how beautifully intertwined this project is with the community, with private investment. Um, and I think it pays everyone here who is aware of the project or isn't just to go onto the, the website and have a look firstly at the product itself have a look at this initiative and you can really see the community story play through both the investment thesis as well as just the value proposition of the product. And um, so when you ask him, is COVID obviously an impact? Of course it is with hospitality. Um, it absolutely is that. Um, and specifically on the timing of the project as well, just opening. Um, but we, one of the big positives has been obviously the international uptick, um, the support of international tour operators and those bookings folks through towards the end of this year. So no one knows how this will play out, but uh, I think one thing that's very important that you alluded to is the long-term nature of, of 12-year investments. Really a little bit more unique is that it's a 10-year investment term for investors. So it is a much longer uh, investment horizon. And one of the big benefits of, of being such a long-term horizon for investors and why they have a vested interest is because they receive uh, right of use with their investment. So not only are they incentivized to be in the investment for 10 years, but they incentivize to utilize it as a leisure asset as well. So that longer time frame will hopefully give the, the lot itself time to flatten the curve of this specific uh, downfall and pick up in that international occupancy that it was so achieving prior to the lockdown. So yeah, just to kind of give you a bit of impact on, or a bit of background onto the story, its impact, um, it is a lot to bring into a short little intro, but I would urge everyone who's intrigued about this just to have a look at the website because I think it beautifully introduces the story quite nicely to the audience. Thanks, Darren. Uh, Amrish, you represent the Pepper Club, which is in the inner city of Cape Town. Uh, do you want to give us some uh, background as to your fund? Hi, Jeff. Thanks a lot. Um, thank you, everyone, for making the time this morning. So yeah, as Jeff says, um, the Pepper Club is also a hospitality investment. It's underpinned by a really nice piece of quality real estate in the middle of the Cape Town CBD. As um, Darren's mentioned, hospitality assets have taken a pounding. Um, fortunately, conservative management has resulted in a robust balance sheet given that we took no debt on. So there are no loan repayments or covenants to worry about. As a consequence, uh, management are focused on business strategy as we don't have to spend any time negotiating with lenders. Uh, I see some of our investors have signed in and I've taken one or two emails from some of you. Um, investors are well protected given the operating yield guarantees that were negotiated and secured by the fund manager from the hotel operator. You further protected by the put option that was negotiated with the vendor not to mention the attractive funding, which has now given anyone who took the geared option the benefit of two interest rate decreases. Um, again, yeah, the other speakers have, have said it explicitly. Section 12 is a long-term investment by virtue of the fact that you have to be invested for at least five years. The market thinks that the COVID pandemic is a 12 to 15 month event. Um, the average bear market is a 15 month event. And the South African government thinks the crisis will peak in September and then contemplate a six to eight month recovery for the restart of the economy in stages, you know, to prevent um, further transmissions. Um, to put this in perspective, the SARS outbreak was three years of pain coupled with three months of recovery. Um, so it's, it'll probably be rough in, into the end of the year. 
It's worth pointing out, though, that the year to date, from January to the end of March, the JSE's all share index was down 25%, 24.8. So you still did well with a 12J investment that gave you a 45% deduction. Um, on a more optimistic note, Mark Mobius, a veteran emerging markets investor with more than 30 years of experience, is currently in lockdown in Durban of all places. And last week wrote a piece from there called A Letter from Durban. His closing paragraph said, despite all the challenging issues facing the country, the bottom line is that South Africa is fundamentally a rich country in terms of agriculture, mining, and tourism. We are confident the country could emerge from this crisis and move into positive economic development territory. So I looked up the tourism numbers, and the tourism sector in South Africa does contribute 7% to the GDP and almost 10% of our employment. It's, it's, well, it's actually 9.2%, but, but it's a significant contributor to this economy. Um, so... The, I mean, the reasons we think that an investor in the hospitality industry doesn't really have to worry is that upon recovery, travel demand will likely be higher than ever. Uh, you know, everyone's in lockdown, and it's hard to imagine a post-pandemic world where people are not desperate to travel again. Um, you know, we believe that obviously some people will be scared to take long-distance flights, and probably the market will be more domestic travel, people taking staycations or traveling locally, alternatively business travel. This hotel's well positioned to cater to both of those. Um, it's close to, you know, from a leisure point of view, it's close to Table Mountain, the waterfront, Robben Island is accessible. From a business point of view, it's in the middle of the city. Um, and you know, the industry has attracted prominent investors. Um, uh, Bill Ackman from Pershing Square has put a big amount of money into Hilton Worldwide this past month. And China is already showing signs of recovery. If we look at industry reports from Smith Travel Research, who produced something called the STR report, uh, mainland China hotels have already reached a 31.8% daily occupancy from a low of 7.4% in, in early Feb. So while we're obviously a few months behind China, this is good news and something we can look forward to. Um, on the hotel itself, um, our own strategies, we understand that people will be nervous and so we're adopting best in class cleaning and safety protocols in order to minimize the risk of infection and transmission when the hotel reopens. Um, you know, this is not the hotel industry's first experience with a global crisis. Um, there was SARS, there was the GFC. And if we look at research that's come out of those experiences, what's become, what's, what was clear is that as hotel profits drop, what one shouldn't do is discounting. Because when the recovery comes, it's harder to push your prices up. Um, so we're keeping an eye on that. And then current thinking is that Hotels should spend a lot of their resources on digital marketing initiatives during a crisis. Um, not, not because you're looking for bookings now, but to encourage bookings once things have started to come, calm down. And yeah, so I would like to say that I think we're on top of this. Uh, thank you, Amarish, uh, for that uh, quite a detailed report. Uh, much appreciated. Uh, an asset class that is Quite interesting is, is the rental of assets uh, asset class, which over you represent a, a fund called Sunstone Capital. Uh, do you want to tell us a little bit about that fund? Yeah, absolutely. Thanks again, Jeff. Hi, everyone, once again. Um, just to, this is actually quite a simple fund and, and they're quite interesting mechanics to how it works. So what we do is we invest, as Jeff mentioned, in operating assets. Practically, that can look like, and just going back on our historical investments, anything from the likes of a commercial fleet vehicles, um, ride hailing vehicles, which are used in the likes of an Uber, outdoor media assets like billboards, etc. And what we really do is we, we offer a unique solution and um, traditional high purchase agreements for, the, for companies to go to the banks. It's, it's quite difficult. A, the administrative point of it can be quite difficult um, and really 
arduous and, and can slow business down and not allow it to be responsive enough. And B, you know, it's, it can be expensive and not well structured. So what we do is we go and we offer businesses a rental of assets. We go and purchase the assets. So a typical example, we'll purchase a commercial fleet vehicle, a bucky. Um, you know, we'll use our strategic advantages to buy it at a steep discount. And we'll then just offer a fixed monthly rental to the likes of an Avis. Um, and then we run that vehicle for 18 to 36 months. And then we will dispose of it and reinvest into a new fleet. Um, there's quite a complexity around how we structure the deals, but really it's just a straightforward rental. And, and what's really nice about this is while we do compete with the banks in terms of price, um, we, have, we were able to structure our product in quite a unique way. Um, practically, this allows businesses to grow, expand, match market demand at a much more rapid rate. And, and I think COVID-19 and its effect on this industry is exceptionally interesting uh, for a number of reasons. And, and I'm first going to run through, I guess, the effects and then some of the mitigations that we have working in our favor. So I think the first thing to understand is to date, we haven't seen any direct adverse effect in terms of any of our counterparties, you know, the businesses that we work with actually going under and not being able to pay rent. Or well, we did have, we had an interesting scenario. We, we have a small fleet of Ubers and that Uber fleet, you know, has, it does struggle a little bit to operate at the moment for obvious reasons. So what they requested is a payment holiday, which again, so effectively what we're doing is we're going to take a three, they've asked for a 90 day vacation where they don't pay their rentals now, but instead they're capitalized and they'll repay them as the market opens up and as the demand for Ubers picks up. Um, what's nice from a 12J point of view on this point is again, it's a five year view. So there's a little bit of time value of money lost there, but predominantly you haven't actually lost out on your capital. You haven't lost out on your returns that are owed. It's just slowed with time. So that's been quite interesting. Um, an adverse effect is, as Jeff mentioned, you know, the fact that we've dropped 200 bips. Um, so prime dropping 2%. Some of our contracts, you know, historically the first set of contracts that we set up were linked to prime. And as a result, those rentals have been reduced slightly, but I think about 70% of our portfolio at the moment is not linked to prime, they're fixed price rentals. And so we shouldn't actually see too much of an adverse effect from that. The other side of it is, again, we've taken an approach of caution. We had a whole bunch of investments lined up. Um, what Sunstone prides itself on is rapid deployment. We've always deployed within three months of closing a fund, of closing a capital raise. And this year we actually had a whole bunch of investments lined up. There's some into the medical asset rental space, which is really exciting and a few new plays. But as a ball, we took a view to A, let things go a little bit slower um, just to re really dig into the underlying investment, see the market play out a little bit and make sure we're making optimal investments. Because again, these are, these are medium term contracts. You don't want to rush it. So the negative effect of that is money is being earned at a, you know, in a current and we're not a call account in a special income yielding account, but we have lost 2% on that. So while it's sitting in that account, there is an adverse effect in terms of the yield. And that being said, you know, capital is preserved and we haven't taken on additional risk. So, and again, I, I think the board and I think the decision there has been really good. Um, and interestingly enough, as the conversations have developed, we've seen how well these businesses have been responding. And I'm sure, I think we might touch on it later, but just with the hygiene response and how they're planning for a post COVID-19 world has been very interesting, but, but there's really been a lot of thought and a lot of preparation gone on to how we're going to cope with this after everything opens up. Um, some of the mitigants that we have working in our favor at Sunstone Capital, is A, we don't take on the operational risk. So when we go and rent out a bucky to, to the likes of an Avis, we, we don't care how much that bucky is used. Indirectly, obviously we do, we need their business to go well, but at a core level, we don't earn a different rental based on the utility of the bucky, um, which again provides for a little bit of more of stability and security with what we can expect in terms of yield. Um, these are highly liquid assets. And all the assets we purchase have a ready market, have somewhere that we could sell quite quickly into if we need to, and we retain ownership of these assets. So that means if someone were to default, one of the parties that we're working with, we do have the option of disposing of the asset for cash and then looking for an alternative investment without suffering too much significant damage. Um, so it is, there is a lot of security. There's other securities involved, but at a core, the fact that we own the asset and that we get a fixed income from it allows us a little bit of confidence and, and stability and security going forward. Um, yeah, I think it's really an exciting space. I think 
South Africa post COVID-19, you know, SME and the parties that we work with, there is going to be a growth funding gap. So we're really going to be able to look at a whole range of businesses which, which have strong underpins. They've been around for a while. They're secure. They're established. They've built up a reputation of revenue. And we're going to be able to come in and help them grow and respond in line with this market. And I think the flexibility and, and fluidity of a Sunstone offering post COVID-19 is going to be a very, very exciting space to be. Um, I think that's it for now, Jeff. Yeah, thanks, Avi. That was very, very interesting. Darren, you represent uh, a fund uh, which is a portfolio fund, uh, which is probably a combination of all the fund managers or the similar type of assets under, in your portfolio. Do you want to talk about uh, your Meta Capital Fund? Sure, Jeff. So um, Meta Capital really presents the market with its first aggregated product solution. And what I say by that is, is it's very similar to what you would have within the listed space in terms of an ETF unit trust where you have an aggregated vehicle that gives you exposure to different segments within the market. So we've seen the very popular rise of these type of aggregated vehicles within traditional asset classes. And uh, it is Metal Capital's vision to kind of provide a platform specifically for first time 12 j investors to have a very similar investment experience to invest into a single um, vehicle that gives them the exposure to market leading fund managers, but also market leading investment strategies throughout the different segments that operate within 12J. And obviously you've heard a few of them here today within renewable energy, hospitality, renewable energy both in the residential space and corporate and industrial space because both have very different market drivers as you've heard. So Meta Capital provides investors with that diversified option. Um, and more so than that, it also provides investors with uh, an adequate supporting and uh, compliance body which sits as the board of Meta Capital that monitor the investment throughout the investment period provide regular reporting updates so you, you as an investor who've dipped your toe into section 12j through a diversified platform such as meta can then obviously see um, the post investment performance of your different underlying investments within the portfolio again helping you make a decision going forward into 12j helping you kind of understand the market specifically and it was designed to be really the first point of call for section 12j investors as well as the most complete offering within the space i mean if we've seen the growth trajectory of 12j not just in assets under management but also in the number of participants within space it becomes quite difficult for investors to choose which investment strategy they should be aligned to for this five to six year period. And also what risk level are they willing to take? Um, and that's really having a, a, a competent investment committee and manager in, in, in Meta Capital makes that decision for investors um, who don't have, I guess, the, the necessary knowledge and transparency within the space to make that decision for themselves. So we run a a very stringent investment process that aims to select the market leader within each sector and we apply a weighting and composition to a portfolio um, that gives investors the best weighted return um, taking into consideration the risk profile and to date we've built very moderate risk profiles um, and what I say by that is that we focus very heavily on asset underpins um, that underpin the investment strategy and we've done that for two key reasons one an asset underpin provides a very clear pathway to liquidity you can realize that asset underpin um, at the end of five years um, to facilitate an exit and two is that asset underpins as you've heard with the renewable energy space the ppas that sit under them hospitality etc a very predictable yield profile and that allows us to be quite uh, accurate when we forecast the dividend yields that come through to our investors um, and uh, we also have the luxury of choice where we can select the real market leader out of 180 participants. We generally select between five or six, depending on the market. And we can be very, very stringent in who we include in our portfolios because we don't charge an additional fee to our investors. Therefore, we are uh, at the behest of the success of the portfolio. So we want the strongest investment strategies to be in there um, so that we ourselves as a business can also receive the revenue through these fee sharing agreements. Um, and we don't charge our investors for, for any of that. So that really is the proposition behind the fund of funds. It's the proposition behind our investment thesis and how we build funds. Um, and, uh, and, and just to kind of allude to, just following up on, on the, the second part of the question on, on the COVID aspect, I think so often you'll read that um, from all these financial articles around how do you deal with the pandemic and the importance of diversification during these types of times, 
that's where really this kind of product offering has stood really well ahead, um, specifically in our, in our Feb 2020 reporting, showcasing the different microeconomic factors within each of these segments. Hospitality obviously isn't quite where it is now, but might have a much higher realization value three, four years from now. So that portfolio, that diversification can take that into consideration whilst having very annuity type funds like the renewable energy space, like the renewable asset space, facilitating those returns as another segment is underperforming at that point of time. So the diversification um, argument is very strong, specifically in times like these. Um, and I hope that kind of adequately just discusses Meta Capital, its proposition, and uh, the importance of diversity, specifically when you have um, almost, not to say industry specific, but industries that are hit harder due to specific circumstances. Okay, great, thanks, Darren, thank you for that. Okay, so we've now had uh, pretty much uh, a full uh, understanding of the different funds that uh, on the panel today, across all the different asset classes, and, and a fund of fund which incorporates uh, probably most of the asset classes around today. I think uh, a lot of questions have been, you know, uh, we've been seeing some chat questions about returns. Will returns uh, actually be affected as a result of COVID? Will dividends still be declared? And Abby, let me go to you. Won't you maybe talk to both maybe Decentral uh, as well as Sunstone as to uh, how you see one, uh, you know, is it going to be a per changing performance and will there be dividends being declared? Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, absolutely. So, look, I think, again, this is a space we need to watch. But as things stand, there will be a slight, let me talk first from a sunstone point of view, maybe. We, we do expect a slight drop in terms of the return. There absolutely will be dividends paid. Reason for this is we're still earning income. We're still generating revenue. I think in the short term, you know, over the next month or two, as you mentioned, um, the fact that, you know, the investments that we make earn a much higher yield than a bank account. Um, so as a result, there'll be a short term drop there. And I think in the long run or medium term run, you know, we don't expect to see significant adverse effects. Definitely not at this point in time. There may be a delay in terms of certain cash flows, but we target two dividends a year and we, on, we should be on target to pay both out one in August, one in Feb. And most importantly, I think it's important. It's worth noting um, a lot of the investments, you know, from from the time that we've started developing the, the investment strategy around Sunstone have actually been at slightly above hurdle rates. So we're earning better rentals than we targeted. So I think a five year investment horizon, an investor looking at their, their returns after five years should expect and we expect at the same time to at least hit their, their five year targeted IRR. In terms of Decentral, we actually pay out more once about once a year. And um, what's nice there is there's a blend of dividend yield and capital growth that makes up your financial return. And us being able to, to, to target more attractive portfolios at this time, while still you know, not needing to be in a short-term cash crunch, does mean we will expect to do a dividend this year. We'll certainly expect capital growth again this year. Um, the dividend will likely be a little bit reduced, again, just by virtue of the fact that we've taken some more time to deploy our assets and, and maybe one or two assets being, de you know, delayed cash flow timing. But, but I think overall, the, the underlying investments, and I guess that's probably the answer I would give. The most important thing is, you know, people are going to ask, is my capital secure? I think to date, this isn't a secure asset class. You know, barring the tax benefit, the actual underpins are strong. They've got long-term agreements. They're liquid assets. Um, and we own the assets in both these scenarios. So in terms of dividends, maybe a little bit slower this year, but I still think in both these funds, the five-year investment horizon is still optimistic. Okay, thanks, Avi. And Maresh, going into the hospitality, because hospitality, as we know, has taken probably the hardest hit, uh, but I am aware that you guys have a guaranteed yield. Does that mean that notwithstanding the performance of your fund, that investors will still get dividends? Oh, hi, Jeff. Yeah, thanks for that question. Yeah, the, fa uh, the fact is that the hotel is currently closed because of the, the impact of COVID. But you're exactly right, because the management company negotiated these guaranteed returns, an investor who came in for cash will definitely get a dividend. And investors who took the geared option 
will still get the return required to service their funding. So, so the short answer is yes, they will get the guaranteed minimum operating yield. Okay, great. So you're saying notwithstanding that you have a guaranteed operating yield and guaranteed dividends, notwithstanding the performance of your fund? Yeah, and further, given that, as we said, I mean, the 12J is a five-year investment. This is maybe a 12 to 15-month event, and some of those months have already passed. On our future capital raise, we'll continue to offer these terms. In other words, a funded subscription. For, for people who think that's a nice way to de-risk their investment. Okay, good. Adrian, you, you, your fund, uh, obviously in the energy sector, in residential, which you spoke to is probably ex has played into the hands of COVID, which we obviously people are using more energy during the lockdown period because at home probably cooking more meals. Um, what is your what is your fund's performance looking like as a result of COVID? Is there, is there, other than what you've projected, is there improvement? Um, our existing projects are doing exactly as we've uh, pro projected. Um, we're not anticipating any kind of downtick there uh, because uh, our clients were already paying less than what they were paying for the existing power bills. They will continue to save money. Um, it's not like they need to cut back on uh, unnecessary frills or bells and whistles. Um, they would have had to pay more or the same price to their previous supplier of electricity. Uh, um, going forward, there may be some issues in terms of securing enough stock. Uh, luckily, with the projects that we're currently developing, uh, we secured that stock before uh, the outbreak of the coronavirus and, and at previous pricing. So actually at an exchange rate of 14.50, uh, which is much better than what it is at the moment. Going forward, I think there may be some challenges with a new exchange rate. It's not at all uh, going to uh, be a barrier to us going forward. It only means we need to be a bit more creative uh, with the way that we structure these projects, uh, maybe introduce a certain element of gearing. I mean, with interest rates, what they are, uh, we can still sign projects at such a point where investors can still earn the yields that they need to um, while still being able to offer the same value to, to our customers. And for us having being able to introduce gearing, um, we're able to ensure that returns are the same as what they were previously. So the exchange rate is, it's, it's definitely a new uh, nuance to this entire project, but with the exchange rate having reduced, uh, sorry, with the exchange rate, the uh, interest rates having reduced to what they are, um, there's definitely some, uh, some new tools in, in, our, in our toolbox to go, go forward with these things. Okay, great, thank you. Now, um, uh, Darren, uh, obviously, uh, your hospitality, as we, we've spoken about, has taken a hit. We're expecting that uh, it will come back on board. I do know that Matluli focuses on or had historically focused on international visitors. What are you doing now once a lodge opens and we're allowed to open? Uh, what are you doing in order to attract visitors to Matluli? Sure, sure, Jeff, and I think it's very, very uh, depth that we, we explore this. Um, and I actually got asked a, a personal question just on this chat line from an investor of ours, and I wanted to get to this as well. So it's a very good question that you ask. It is. Uh, it has presented a, a new dynamic for Blue, being its price point and being its spec, um, as well as the, the leverage of Turvest being the, the largest average inbound tour operator. As you mentioned, the general market or target market was for the international audience. Um, specifically, generally forecast between 65 to 70% of guests were to be uh, international occupancy um, on the back of, of, of tour groups and uh, tour agreements, um, which already some were signed, some specifically large ones were signed, and some were meant to fill the beds from as early as June onwards for the next three years in terms of weekly allotments through these agreements. So it has presented uh, Mbuli with uh, and now a, an opportunity um, to move into the domestic travel space. And uh, really they're doing this in kind of three scenarios, setting that one, looking at opening in June, being at really where we anticipate level two to possibly um, begin having domestic tourism online. Um, scenario B, 
be opening up in July or later on scenario C in August. We are lucky that we have underwriters that provide us with the adequate working capital that we can then um, take advantage of any of these scenarios that open and allow us to immediately begin operations. But how we're going about doing that is very important. And we're looking at really creating awareness around the lodge specifically to the domestic market. And we're doing that through co creating compelling packages to drive the post COVID-19 occupancies. We one of the few in the market now that have allowed investors and not just investors, a guest to go and stay at the lodge, but pay on a pay-as-you-can basis. So utilizing when you have the disposable income to pay for that, that booking that you'll make. So again, helping the consumer who obviously is uh, in need of this kind of assistance, um, then we are aware that there'll be a, a, a large increase in domestic travel, marketing campaigns and uh, incentives. And we believe, again, with this agile management and marketing team, these packages are really, really compelling. The spec itself is really compelling. The effective channels that they're driving these marketing channels through to both B2B and B2C, the discussions and existing um, relationships with Tourvest um, and other well-known tour operators to move and transition into the domestic market space through these really successful packages that they've put forward, these successful payment plans that they've put forward. I think Putin Blue is a really good point to, to drive into the domestic market. Um, while we wait for international occupancies to start rising, which we foresee, let's say, towards the end of Q1, I'm sorry, Q4 of this year, gradually increasing throughout 2021, and then hopefully returning to pre-COVID levels towards the end of 2021. So that's kind of what the translation has been in terms of the occupancy strategy. Um, it's allowed these flexible payment options, these flexible accommodation activity packages, giving the domestic consumer the, the choice that they really didn't have before, specifically on a spec like this. So the product spec was speak for itself, and I think with the incentives put in place to drive domestic travel, I think it really puts itself in a really good position as soon as um, these levels allow us to, to begin operations. Okay, thanks, Darren. I mean, uh, okay, so maybe just uh, this, uh, uh, some a question that we've had over here is, is notwithstanding the fact that in, uh, in decentral energy, you, uh, in, you, you're delivering energy to shopping centers, does it mean that, you, that your energy that you recover is less now because some of the shops are closed? Or is there, or are you a guaranteed of the, of the billings that in terms of your PPA? Great question, thanks, Jeff. Um, most of our PPAs are structured with, with something called take or pay. So that means that, you know, even though, as I mentioned, we have seen a roughly 5% drop in terms of the shopping center's usage, um, you know, our tenants or the guys who we're selling energy to are still required to buy at least 97.5% of the energy we produce. And there's a 2.5% leeway that they're given. And, and effectively, you know, and again, that's where the, the, the exercise became really interesting. Um, even if they're using five or 10 or 20% less, they're actually still saving by purchasing energy through us than if they were purchasing it off the grid. Even though they may, they may be paying for more energy than they would, otherwise they're paying such a reduced rate that it actually makes sense for them. Okay, good, thank you. So it, what you're really saying is at the end of the day, that notwithstanding the fact that uh, there is shutdown on certain stores, uh, the, the off-taker is responsible to still make good uh, in terms of your PPA. Okay, Absolutely. good. Darren, Darren, just going back to you and in terms of Meta Capital, obviously it's a portfolio of funds and you've now, uh, you know, you, you've got three uh, funds. Is there any particular, I mean, is there any weighting or that is going to bring down, uh, in, in your opinion, the, the, the results or the RR to investors in any of your funds? So, um, specifically within Fund 2 and Fund 3, um, we had a very high weighting to, to dividend yielding type strategies, the, the, the likes that you've heard from some stone um, the likes that you've heard from the renewable energy space so we do foresee obviously as they've mentioned a slight decrease possibly in the annuity income they receive because some of their contracts are linked to prime um, however we specifically within the hospitality strategies that we've adopted within uh, 
within Meta Capital um, through Optimize Ventures. They also have an underwriting agreement that we've done a thorough due diligence on in terms of the financial viability that these can be um, underwritten specifically upon distress um, and within the, the, the property developers that they've partnered with on various projects, the hospitality side we're very comfortable with. So yes, we do have exposure to hospitality, but similar to what Amarisha alluded to, there's a full underwriting in place that protects income yields um, and also guarantees an exit at the end of four and a half years. So we're very comfortable across where our main kind of weak spot would have been in the portfolio. And again, that alludes back to our risk mitigating strategies while we build our our risk profile on moderate risk, while we have such a strong emphasis on quality management, quality asset underpins. And that has really kind of put us to the test throughout this period and allowed us to kind of showcase why we have built products on this type of risk profile, why there are so many mitigants within these investment strategies that we look for and weight highly in our investment decisions. So within the hospitality space would have been a natural kind of um, portion of our portfolio that definitely would have been vulnerable. But because of the mitigation of an underwriting, um, that has allowed us to, to be very comfortable across that space. Within the others, as I alluded to, some might be impacted by Prime. Others will be impacted by slower deployment, um, or, although over a five-year investment horizon, that can be smoothed quite gradually. Um, for instance, within Westbrook Step, our student accommodation play, they have put a moratorium on all new deals for the next two months. But on the other side, they, they believe that they can acquire assets at much discounted values um, on, on, the, on the onset of, of business returning to normal and obviously on depressed uh, sellers looking to, to utilize the, the Section 12J funding. Um, they believe they can uh, increase their yields and, and realization values at the end of the investment term due to the acquisition price that they might be able to obtain uh, in the next two, three months. So deployment definitely might have a lag. We've seen that within other disruptions like the, the TLAB amendment bill, which amended the Tax Act in October 2018. So we've seen these type of disruptions and and generally the first thing to fall is generally deployment um, as these you know companies are very capital preservation focused in these times of uncertainty they do look to sit on cash and only conclude deals when things become a bit clearer which is very responsible and again a big reason why a key management team is so important so for us we we are well mitigated um, on the back of the investment decision to even have them in our portfolio we're aware of the mitigants and it's nice in a time like this that these can be applied and be shown to be effective to date um, but we are aware there will be gradual disruptions. But over the five-year investment term, we do think the smoothing process will allow us to be very close um, to what we forecasted to investors. Okay, thank you, Darren. Uh, Adrian, you alluded to the fact that there's a big demand for residential type uh, requirements or for your solar solutions. I mean, can you talk a little bit about your pipeline? Are you looking to raise capital? Do you have, I mean, I mean, yeah, what is your supply like? What is the demand? Just talk to that pretty much uh, in terms of the residential uh, requirements. Um, from, from the demand side, we've had a substantial uptick, oh, sorry, uptick in, in the recent past. Um, we've, we can probably develop another four or five complexes in the next six to eight months. Um, so before the end of this year, we would have them signed stock secured and, and uh, the construction should be complete. Um, this is all down just to everybody working from home and understanding how important it is um, to have these options available. And also with more people having time on their hands to actually uh, investigate alternatives. Um, so they have a look at whether it be a UPS or a generator and then they have a look at the costs of these items. They see how exorbitant they are. And then they look for alternative ways of funding these. And uh, then they come across us, um, or other, in other cases, we work with, with uh, a number of parties um, that actually do introductions. Um, because it's not always so easy getting a, a seat in front of um, a panel of, of trustees or a board of trustees at a complex of 200 odd units. Uh, these people are inundated with requests almost every day. Um, so being able to actually get an opportunity to sit in front of them. In the past, there was a bit of a challenge, but as of recent, uh, with load shedding being what it was just before the pandemic started, there was a lot more interest in, in renewable energies. Um, so we went from an uptick in interest because of the prolonged load shedding, um, and then now with more people understanding the importance of uh, electricity because they have to work from home and they can't rely on the generator at the office um, to be able to work when, when there is a power failure. 
Um, in terms of securing the stock at the moment, uh, it's a bit of a challenge. Um, all the suppliers are closed. Uh, they, however, are opening uh, at the end of this week, um, at, at which point we assume uh, that they will be able to operate at levels that they could beforehand. Obviously, there's certain uh, mitigation measures put in place. So um, when you come and you collect your stock, you'd have to be in a certain uh, place. Uh, they also wouldn't allow any company just to go and uh, do deliveries. They would have to have certain specific entities that have taken the necessary precautions to prevent the spread of any virus. Um, and then also when we get the stock into South Africa, um, in February and January, we saw a bit of a, a constraint on ordinary equipment from China. But uh, as Amarish alluded to earlier, uh, things have really improved there uh, at the point where the factories are able to run at near full capacity. Um, so there's not a shortage of stock. But with the Western world still being as locked down as it is, uh, there's a lot of excess supply as a consequence in China. So we can actually exploit that. And with, with virtually all of this equipment being commoditized, uh, with excess supply, uh, there also comes lower pricing. Um, so we look at, uh, yeah, so we will have a bit more competitive pricing just to offset some of the exchange rate uh, losses we've had. Uh, in terms of funding, uh, we're looking to raise more capital at the end of, um, of this current financial tax year end, so Feb 2021 uh, in Rensel. And uh, we will secure a number of projects specifically with the intention of being funded at that point in time. And then up until that date, we will continue working with our other uh, funding partners, other Section 12 Js or institutional investors uh, to secure the cash to actually build these projects. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks, Orion. Um, I've been asked uh, a, a, a couple of questions, and uh, Avi, I think probably aimed at you. The one is that uh, is at Uber. Now that delivery from the 1st of May, that deliveries will be able to be made. Uh, will this impact or improve? Uh, you know, the rentals coming out of the Uber environment. And the second question, uh, Avi, which I think might be also you could you know direct to you is that the people said uh, a question was if the term of the 12 days of five years what happens when that five-year term has expired a oh, pleasure so start on the uber side um, yes we do expect ubers to pick up and start operating at higher levels um, I think maybe it's important to understand the thinking behind the payment moratorium or the payment holiday let's call it um, I think you know what the, the drivers have requested and what our partners have requested is, is just to allow them a little bit of time to catch up and recover on lost cash flows and lost revenue. So what we're doing is we're giving them an opportunity to rebuild a little bit of a cash base before they start giving additional payments. Um, that being said, I do think you know it, it's likely to improve, I guess, the probability of things and, and we may see earlier payments. But I think from our side, we're not going to drive it too hard. Obviously, there's continuing conversations. You know, we chat, we touch base with the, the management team of the, of the Uber fleet, you know, on a regular basis. And what we want to do is allow them to grow, allow their businesses to stabilize, while at the same time weighing up, you know, the importance of investor returns. So, so we are juggling the two. Um, and I think it is good. I think the overall, you know, the fact that they're already going to be able to operate will be positive. I mean, it's interesting. I think the first week, you know, once the shutdown was announced, Obviously, I, I was in touch with the team and we had some up and downs. And what they've been doing is partnering with grocery delivery companies. So your Uber drivers have been, obviously, you know, people aren't able to go in store as much as they historically could. And they're reliant on a lot more deliveries. So Uber has actually partnered up with that to allow some kind of income generation. Um, I think what's going to be important is that although Ubers will be operating, you know, as of 1 April, um, the question is at what capacity how much are they going to be utilized? So it's going to be an ongoing monitoring process, but it's, it's definitely positive. And, and I think their response has been phenomenal. You know, Uber Worldwide, by the way, has, has come out with a, with a ruling that all Ubers have to, that they're going to make sure they're sanitized and that they've got sanitizer inside the Ubers for prospective clients, et cetera. So, so there's really been a strong response from their side and, and a rapid response. So, so I think it is positive. Um, to answer your second question, Jeff, in terms of exit, uh, this is a great example. You know, our assets are constantly cycled in Sunstone, as I mentioned, 18 to 36 months traditionally. So what it'll look like is, let's say there's a five-year investor term. You know, after three years, assets will get, then be repurchased. So we'll sell the assets, we'll dispose of them, we'll buy a new fleet at a two-year view, let's call it. 
and at year five, these are highly liquid assets. And I think that's what's important to understand. Um, you know, a commercial vehicle has value. There's already market for it. It's actually interesting because it's actually quite a nice hedge because at the moment, what we're seeing is a slowdown on manufacturing of first-hand vehicles. And generally, in an, you know, in an economy which is in a depression, it's a nice hedge because people are less likely to purchase first-hand vehicles. Now it's harder to manufacture first-hand vehicles. And as a result, the value of the residual value on second-hand vehicles does pick up. So A, it's a nice hedge, but B, what we'd look like is at the end of year five, we would take those assets, we'd sell them on the market, and obviously we have assistance. It's not just us. We work closely with our partners to make sure we're getting ideal prices and there's certain residual guarantees in place. But really what we do do is we will then dispose of those assets in a lot of cash. So you as an investor would say in year five, I'm ready to pull out of my investment. I've, my tax benefits become permanent. And now I'd just like to you know, maybe reinvest my money into a 12-day or another structure what we would do then is dispose of a portion of our assets according to the amount of liquidity that's required. This could happen at a very quick rate. We would then have cash in our bank account. We would then use that cash to repurchase those shares from you as an investor. So we buy your, share back, your shares back from you as a fund. You get the cash and, and life goes on and the cycle rolls on. I hope that's addressed your question. Thank you. Okay, I've had another, okay, so just for the results of the poll that you've just seen, guys, uh, is that on the call, uh, we've had up to 100 people on the call today, and 42% uh, have are invested in a Section 12J and 60% aren't in a Section 12J. So we welcome all those people who have not invested currently into Section 12J to be more informed, and hopefully uh, that, that they can, uh, you know, they can... Uh, become part of the 12J community. So welcome. Um, uh, another sorry, question. sorry, Jeff. Jeff, hi, Jeff. My name is Fabian Manuel. I'm sorry to interrupt the flow of the conversation that you are um, so uh, so competently um, uh, facilitating, right? Uh, just a quick one to sort of slip in there, right? Because my typing skills on this iPad is uh, letting me down. A quick one to slip in, given the fact that you've got 42% of the participants today uh, being investors in Section 12 J's, right? Um, is there an opportunity for you to engage with that particular group um, from a Grovest perspective and also from the in terms of the various other funds, we obviously can directly engage with your Daryls and Avis and Amoreshas of this world, right? Um, but from a Grovest perspective, the ones that you guys administer, is there an opportunity for us to engage with you as shareholders? Yeah, of course, of, of course it is, but Fabian, uh, I'm happy to take that offline. Any of the funds that you wish to discuss, we can set up, uh, you know, the meetings with the various fund managers and we can take you through in a much more detailed manner. Appreciate it. Uh, Jeff, I'd just like to pop, pop in just to now, just to say that for, for Unglulu investors who might be on here, we will be doing a webinar in the next week or so, just to also uh, allude to Fabian's point, to have that direct communication on maybe a smaller platform to allow them to obviously uh, ask uh, the direct questions that they might not want to ask here. So just to let them know, and I think this was a good opportunity to do that. Okay, good. Okay, so just so another question that was asked is uh, is to Amaresh, specifically to you, if you can please expand on the guaranteed yield of the Pepper Club, because it seems to be, you know, people are asking for clarity. Maybe you didn't explain it correctly. So can you, you want to have another bash? Sure, thanks. I was actually going to ask that because I'm getting a lot of messages on, on the side here. So when the management go, when the fund manager put this transaction together, we spoke to the hotel operators and the vendors and negotiated for our investors a guaranteed minimum return. We're the only hospitality section 12J that offers this to the best of my knowledge. Apart from the financial return that's guaranteed, the investors also get a package of room nights, which is simply six room nights for every million rand invested. And over and above that, because there have been some questions about the put option, you know, there are other liquidity events, you know, maybe we take the 12J to a listing. We spoke about that um, in last year's round of fundraising, and that's not off the table. But should, some, should something happen and someone absolutely wants to get out, they do have a put option. 
um, th this is obviously a last a last course of option, but it does give you a liquidity event that you, gives you some peace of mind. You won't be stuck in something, and it gives you a floor. Uh, you, you know that there's a certain minimum below which you actually can't go. So on that operating return, regardless of what's happening at the hotel right now, the providers of the return have a very strong balance sheet and they stand behind these underwritten returns. Um, it's again also worth pointing out that this is a short-term event and 12J is a long-term investment. So there are also questions here about the valuation, et cetera. And what I've said is, well, I haven't said this part, the replacement cost or the cost to construct an asset of this class doesn't change. And given that the incomes haven't changed, we don't see that or the income to an investor, we're happy with the valuation. We're also happy with the operating asset. Um, there was a question here from, I think, Sia Bonga that said, will we relook at our investment strategy? And what I want to say is the reason we've managed to negotiate this financing package where an investor can come in um, with a very attractive funding package is because of the quality of the asset. It's also worth pointing out that, you know, COVID's going to have a lot of casualties and without a doubt, the airlines are going to be a casualty. So what I looked up ahead of this call was which, what are the li likely repercussions of things like um, certain, I mean, Air Mauritius is in receivership, who knows what will happen with SAA. But of the 10 busiest routes to South Africa and in South Africa, two of them are Dubai to Cape Town and Heathrow to Cape Town. A further two are Dubai to Joburg and London or Heathrow to Joburg. The fifth busiest is the connecting flight from Joburg to Cape Town. And um, sadly, as Adrian's point out, pointed out, the exchange rate has tanked. And when it goes down 30% from 14 to the dollar to 19, we actually are a cheap tourism destination. I don't believe the flights to South Africa will be culled. And in a perverse way, this may work for a person. Um, but in the meantime, an investor is completely protected with those guaranteed minimum returns, which is why we can continue to offer the funding package going forward. Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, I hope that uh, clarifies the question. I think uh, and, and, uh, other questions that have come on is that what is liquidity like in various funds? So it's been said that uh, after the five years, how quick is it to get uh, how quick is it to easy or to get rid of your shares or, or trade your shares or whatever? And I'm sure each of the funds have different mechanics on how to get there. So maybe, uh, Darren, you want to talk maybe about Medluli, uh, the exit, uh, maybe in terms of Meta, and we can quickly whip around in terms of liquidity and if events investor wants to uh, convert their shares into cash, uh, if we can just talk to that very quickly. Sure, so I'm just going to allude to Meta um, because it is obviously very different to Mbluli, but I'll allude to Meta first. And again, it kind of speaks to our, our mitigating model that we look at and, our, and our, our risk profile when we build and compile these portfolios. Is a pathway to liquidity is one of the key due diligences that we we have to be comfortable with before we include any Section 12J within our fund. And again, it plays onto the asset underpin model that, that uh, the asset that underpins the financial investment strategy and the financial returns needs to have a realizable market that that can be um, sold in to facilitate, as Avi mentioned, a share buyback or other type of exit mechanism. So the asset underpin model um, is very, very strong in this uh, particular area of, of due diligence, being a clear liquidity pathway. And for instance, we're in a variety of our funds, they can realize the asset underpins the model, be it a brick and mortar asset or a contractual asset to generate a pool of capital to facilitate a share buyback. So that's very, very uh, important consideration. We look at a meta and that provides us the liquidity for investors to exit. Um, we actually had an investor, unfortunately, exit our first portfolio at the end of last year. Uh, and we were able to facilitate that exit within uh, two weeks. And I just, it just kind of showcases the liquidity profiles here. Um, and that just showcases, again, you know, a lot of investors might have this misconception that it's a lockup period. 
definitely you are incentivized not to. There is obviously a steep recoupment, etc. But the liquidity profile is very important for when you look into any investment option, and we do a thorough due diligence on that. And Meta and each of those asset underpins within the portfolio will have that liquidity pathway. Um, moving on to Mbuli, Mbuli is a very unique scenario where your liquidity pathway really is is not against your best interest to the point that um, and all investors have a right of use benefit that they can utilize the asset. I mean, we're going to run a a bed night package now for our August capital raise. It'll basically allow investors with their capital at risk um, and even on the reg- uh, assumption that you won't receive your capital back. Even on your capital at risk, you can secure a bed night at Mbluli at a thousand rand for 10 years, uh, which is unheard of. The price point currently is about 3,800 per person. And if even if you escalate that at 8%, in 10 years time, that will be close to 7,500 rand. For investors, you know, your vested interest is the leisure asset. To secure it at a thousand rand a night per person for 10 years is is something that is already a guaranteed investment yield, um, obviously subject to the lodge to still remaining operational, which uh, as people who visited will see that that isn't really a concern at the moment. Um, so from that point of view, your exit liquidity pathway is very much al- aligned with your vested interest to use it as a leisure asset. But given that there is a 10-year investment horizon, where upon the 10 years, the conclusion of the 10 years, you will have your full capital repaid, you'll have, if you've selected the ordinary share, a yield return, um, and at the end of 10 years, you have, again, that put option to say, I would like to exit um, the investment, uh, I've enjoyed the 10 years, I would like to facilitate an exit, and then you exercise a put option and an independent valuation is performed on the value of what that share is, which basically is the movable assets on the lodge. Um, if you turn the lodge upside down, anything that falls out will be valued, a value will be assigned to that share, and that'll be an over and above return to the the returns such as your repayment of your investment capital plus any yields etc so that isn't advertised we don't know what that value will be but it'll be independently valued and will facilitate an exit should investor not wish to exit and the management company not wish to exit investors you will then continue to accrue uh, the benefits of your shares being the, the, the dividend side and you'll still get large discounts on the bed nights however you won't receive the bed nights uh, for free or right of use for free so that's where the investment horizon is very different from Gluli. you have have a vested interest to be in the project as long as possible because you want to use it as a leisure asset. So if that kind of explains the two unique liquidity options within both two different projects. Okay, thanks, Darren. Uh, Adrian, do you want to talk about the exit opportunities and how long would it would take to liquidate and the turnaround time should the investor want to dispose of shares? Um, if they want to dispose of shares in the short term, um, depending on the size of the investor, it, it would, um, yeah, it, it, it would depend largely on, on the size of the investor. If somebody who had invested uh, two and a half million rand, uh, that would uh, just, you know, necessitate the need for, uh, you know, selling off some of the assets to actually create that liquidity. But somebody that only had several hundred thousand rand, um, that's that could be facilitated in you no know, more than a few months, um, at worst. Otherwise, less than a month. Uh, I'd like Darren uh, to make the capital we're able to achieve. Um, at the end of the, the five-year investment horizon, there is the, uh, sorry, Darren, your microphone, it's um, feeding back. Um, so at the end of the five-year period, the investors um, would be uh, bought out or that they could have the capital returns to them. And this is quite easily done either by securitizing the assets or introducing debt or having a third party buy out the assets because these are high high yielding um, cash assets with, sorry, high, high yielding assets with, uh, with an asset backed annuity income. They're easy to sell uh, and they're very easy to get um, third parties uh, to buy them out. There's already a huge interest from uh, pension funds uh, um, and uh, the PIC to do just that. Uh, so yeah, those are the options available to us. Okay, great. Uh, Avi, and you would like to talk to about your liquidity of your fund? Sure, absolutely. Um, just starting off with Sunstone, you know, as previously mentioned, Sunstone's highly liquid. So I think towards, you know, about halfway through the fourth year, leading towards the end of, you know, close of the fifth year of your investment, you know, we then reach out specifically with regards to liquidity requirements. You know, touch base with our investor circle, understand who's looking to exit. And for us to just arrange to free up that cash, you know, especially with the six-month heads up, is not too difficult. 
Um, so I expect a fairly quick turnaround time thereafter. So probably within the first month or two, you'll be able to facilitate all those exits. Um, on the energy fund, again, it's a little bit more fluid. We do, I mean, at the moment this year, we actually got a, a call put option, you know, that we've been trying to set up with pension fund has shown a lot of interest. And there's options to, uh, to capitalize the, the cash flows again, which again would allow us to create more liquidity. So there are a lot of options on the table. Um, I, I don't think it'll be as quick as with Sunstone, um, in the, between four to six months, I would estimate, but it could take longer. But at the moment, we are seeing quite a strong secondary market for developed solar assets. So it may be a little bit quicker as well. So again, a little bit more fluid, but but it shouldn't take too long. There is, there's a certain liquidity associated with these assets. Okay, Amaresh, uh, over to you, your liquidity in your fund. Hi, thanks, Jeff. So the exit options as we see them, I don't think have, have changed really. Um, the one option was always that a retail or hospitality operator may make us an offer for this asset and the other assets that are in our pipeline. The second option is that we could take the vehicle to a listing. This again presumes that we put some of the assets in our pipeline in and we don't trade sell them. And the last liquidity option, well, not the last, the second, uh, the third liquidity option is that we could always gear up the assets. I spoke earlier about how this is a, very, a, a VCC with a very robust balance sheet. It's ungeared. We could always gear the underlying asset up moderately and return capital to shareholders. And I suppose the last liquidity option is, of course, that put. Okay, great. So, okay, so I hope, uh, you know, that, uh, that that covers the question from, you know, for the participant who, who wanted that covered. I think we, we, we've got, uh, uh, we've got uh, seven minutes left. And I just want to whip around, uh, maybe for closing, type uh, statements um, as to are you going to be raising additional capital uh, before the end of the year? Are you raising capital going forward? Uh, any last comments that you want to share with the people on this call? And, uh, and, and, and then uh, if you can, I'll just give you a whip around, please, uh, and just one, one and a half minutes each, so we can uh, give everybody a, a share, a, a fair share. So, Darren, I'll start with you. Sure, I'm just going to just uh, start on Gluli. Um, we are going to go to the, the market again. Um, we've already raised the full capital for phase one. We Phase one was the, the common areas and the 50 tents, uh, which looks absolutely stunning. Phase two would just be the amenities like the gym, spa, and other types of, and the community information center, very important, as well as to repay the underwriters that have facilitated uh, um, the operations of the development. So we will be going to market uh, in August of this year. We'll be doing a bed night package just on briefly on the terms that I alluded to. Um, and uh, yeah, we, 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 we very, very confident about uh, achieving this will be our last capital raise just on the back of, of our discussions with other international tour operators who want to take a vested interest into the lodge, much like Tourvest has uh, as our biggest shareholder within the 12J. And it just speaks to the project. It speaks to the players involved. And, uh, and I think one thing, uh, we just need to really be mindful of in this particular project is the, the community involvement here and uh, what the team has done with their COVID um, package and their incentive is really, really something special um, to partner with Spa and Smolens in such in a week or two um, notice and to get this really up and running is something that's going to have a lasting impact. They're looking to generate 1,000 food parcels for a 45,000 strong community and I encourage anyone here who who wants to be touched by a story to go onto the website and particularly play a part in this initiative which will have a lasting impact uh, on this community as this project will for the next 10 to 20 years. Okay, thank you. Uh, Audrey? Thank you, Jeff. Um, Rensal is looking to raise more capital at the end of the Feb 2021 capital raising season. Um, we won't be opening prospectus until then, uh, just because of the market being what it is. Um, and people are a bit more hesitant to invest right now. So we are hoping that things will calm down and uh, rationalize over the coming months. And by the time the November capital raising season opens, we expect to have substantial interest from the market. Okay, great. Uh, and then uh, to you, uh, Avi. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, so each time's again different. Uh, the central we can't be going at that rate. Right? Around maybe you could some feedback coming through. Yeah, just there. Um, Decentral, we're currently undergoing a debt raise. You know, we've actually shown quite a lot of interest from the banks, giving us preliminary term sheets to, to bring some debt into the portfolio, effectively boosting investor returns. Um, that being said, the pipeline is substantial at this point in time. So we are obviously intending on raising additional capital, capital to free up further debt and to start swapping out some of that debt with equity towards the end of the year. Um, probably, you know, if again, depending COVID-19, Ideally, an August raise for those provisional taxpayers looking to take advantage of, of a Section 12J tax deduction, alternatively towards the end of the year. Um, from Sunstone, again, much of a muchness. We've got a lot of exciting new investment strategies. So post this COVID situation, once all our capital is fully deployed, we will go again to market with this with the additional offerings, such as you know, maybe a further press in the Uber, some medical assets, and, and other exciting things that are really happening. So, so there is a lot of opportunity in both of these funds for capital to be raised and deployed responsibly. Um, and we do intend to, over the course of the year, pursue additional capital raising activities. Thanks. Uh, Amarish, uh, to you in terms of Pepper Club. Hi, Jeff. Thanks. So just to confirm, we did have a very successful capital raise um, in the year that's just finished. We intend to go to market again. Nothing changes. We'll again... We've again negotiated um, guaranteed minimum operating yields with the operators. We've again negotiated put agreements and very attractive funding. Um, the funding package is slightly different, but the fact is we can still, we're offering 95% gearing um, to investors. So it's still very attractive. It's still at prime. So, and we've got an attractive portfolio of assets to put it in. The same logic holds true. It's, an asset, the next asset in the pipeline is already constructed, so there's no construction risk. And there is an operating yield that's again guaranteed despite the fact that we exist in this um, COVID situation, which again is, a, we think, a short-term situation. Okay, thank you, guys. So that, that pretty much uh, brings us to an end. I can't believe that it's one and a half hours and, uh, and we probably haven't got to all the questions. To the extent that we haven't got to all the questions, please feel free to drop me a line or any of the fund managers a line at uh, me as jeffm at growvest.co.za and I'm happy to put you in touch with any of the fund managers and if there are any of the funds that have not been covered today that we have got some input into, happy to address them too. One of the questions were, do I think that I can answer was, do we think that uh, that, that there will be, a, because of what's happening with COVID, that there will be a delay in uh, uh, giving back the 12J benefits? I don't, my personal view is that I don't think so. I think that uh, the SARS says, that they would try and give back as much money as they can as quickly as possible. I assume that that's in all respects, whether it's in individual capacity or in uh, in VAT, in order that uh, you know the public can actually take that money and create liquidity and start putting it back into the economy. But be that as it may, I thank everybody on, on the call today, taking the time out, making themselves available. I, th I thank the participants for, for making themselves available. I, I want to also thank the, the, the staff or the marketing team at Grovest for making this um, happen because without you guys in the background, this wouldn't happen. We had uh, in excess of 100 people uh, at, at some stages on the, on the call. So I think it was a great event. I hope it's been of value to you guys. Uh, we hope to have more of these type of webinars uh, covering different topics in the next few weeks. So thanks again for joining and uh, be well, be safe and uh, 12, happy 12J investing. Cheers all. Bye-bye.